So we're going to uh, talk about the Rural Residency Program. And I actually asked uh, Laurel, can I have a little bit of time on Thursday morning uh, to talk about the program before we go into recruitment season? Because people have heard about it, but you know, not as many details. Um, and then she said, oh yeah, sure, you can have an hour. And I, I didn't feel like I really needed an hour, hour but, um, but since she gave me an hour and then she called it Grand Rounds, I decided I needed to really do some research on rural health, right? Rural health disparities, OBGYN, rural Wisconsin. Um, so I've put together a talk that um, I don't think will last the whole hour. I'm gonna leave some time at the end for questions for John and Jody and myself. Um, and just so everybody's kind of on the same page about what we put together and what we're going to do moving forward um, as we go through this first recruitment cycle because we're going to have um, one rural residency track spot and that person's going to match this year and start next July. So, um, so that's what I'm all about this morning. Um, before we get started, um, I just want to tell everybody that um, I didn't really introduce myself, um, but I think most people know. My name is Ellen Hartenbach, and I am uh, I'm a professor in OBGYN, and I've been here about 20 years. And I was at several other academic institutions before I came to this one, which is the most fabulous of all. Uh, and I have been the residency director for three years. Laurel asked me to do it about three years ago. And uh, this rural track idea came up kind of quickly. So. Um, it's something that I didn't necessarily see coming, but, um, but there is a real need. Um, I don't have a ton of street cred. I grew up in suburban St. Louis, um, but I have to tell you, I've been to every single site we're gonna send residents, and I think I've been to almost every county in Wisconsin. So just to get an idea of, of the background of people here, um, who, who grew up in a rural community? Raise your hand if you grew up in a rural community. So that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, and um, there's a lot of people nationally, and there's a shortage of rural health uh, providers, uh, physicians and other providers. So who can name the most counties in Wisconsin? Okay, here's a little competition. Okay, see how many you can name. Who get it? Go ahead. Try it, Carly. There's 72. Can you name all 72? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody think they can name more than Kevin? <laughs> All right, Kevin's from Wausau. Okay, he wins because nobody's going to name any. You didn't even try. You didn't even try. Okay, I have uh, I have one more, um, and and that's basically from who who thinks they're from the smallest community, who grew up in the smallest community. Steve, how many people? Seven hundred. Seven hundred people. Oh. Kathleen? It was a thousand. A thousand. Okay. Klaus? Six hundred. Six hundred people. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Okay, so so I think there's been a lot of interest in this program and actually um, the last time we opened up the applications and we had over 100 people apply for this one spot. So that's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. Um, and I just wanted to kind of go over, my title is Wisconsin Rural Obstetric Workforce, What Do Women Need? It's really what do women and families need, right? Because OB is kind of the, it's the heart of our department, it's the heart of every family. And um, so it's, it's what do the women and the families of Wisconsin need? And I don't have any conflict of interest. I try not to because I sleep better. And the learning objectives, we're going to learn a little bit about rural health disparities, the big picture. Uh, we're going to look at rural workforce in OBGYN in Wisconsin. We're going to try and um, understand uh, Wisconsin and as it fits into the nation. And we're going to develop um, some knowledge about our new rural track. So in terms of rural health disparities, you could do an entire talk on this, but I just kind of pulled out from the literature because I had to do a lot of research on uh, for this little talk, and I learned a lot. and um, And I'm just going to share with you sort of the, the sort of overview of what I've learned. So uh, rural communities in general have higher rates of preventable conditions such as obesity, diabetes, cancer, and injury. Uh, a lot of high risk health behaviors, smoking, physical inactivity, poor diet limited use of seat belts. Um, the population in the uh, rural communities is aging, uh, tend to be a little lower socioeconomic status, 
a higher concentrations of ethnic and racial minorities. And I think the thing that's most germane to this talk is that there are really strained healthcare systems and a lot of access to care issues. Uh, so I, I, I'm a data person, so I looked for a lot of data um, on exactly what's going on in OB in Wisconsin. And I was able to find some things. Uh, I wasn't able to find as much detail as I would have wanted. But the one thing that does come out is the access to care is, is, is really a barrier. And the number of people who get prenatal care in the rural communities is less, and that impacts their perinatal outcomes. So 9% of physicians practice in rural communities and 20% uh, of the population actually lives in rural communities. So, um, so there's right off you see the, the, the disparity in terms of you know, where the physicians are and where the people are. So here is um, a map. Uh, my first question, um, and Jody's done with a lot of research and helped me with th things, and I was like, well, what does rural mean? Like, you know, there's all these, you know, Office of Rural Health, there's all sorts of national bodies, there's all sorts of state groups that are working on rural health issues, and I was like, well, what does rural mean? And, um, and what we came up with and what we figured out is rural means not urban. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that is actually how, that's how the, the, the feds uh, define rural, is that it's not urban. Um, now if you look at this map, these are some select rural healthcare facilities in Wisconsin, and what I find really interesting is the only thing, do I have a pointer? Maybe not. Um, these are the urban areas. So the only urban areas in Wisconsin are around Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin, our area in south central Wisconsin, La Crosse is over there. The uh, uh, Fox Valley and Green Bay are there. Uh, Kevin, there's Wausau. Um, and, and somebody knows what that is? I think that's Eau Claire. Um, so those are, the, those are the urban areas in Wisconsin. And so it's really quite a rural state. Um, and this kind of just gives you a snapshot of where the facilities are. So um, critical access hospitals are hospitals that have been de de defined Oh, I got a pointer. Thank you, Christian. Um, hospitals that have been defined to be in areas where obviously there's a critical access, and there are criteria for how they label something a critical access hospital. But, um, but those are the ones in the blue. Um, rural health clinics are labeled. Um, the federally qualified health centers are, is a federal designation for underserved areas, not necessarily urban, or, or not necessarily urban or rural, and then um, skilled facilities. So, um, so you can see there's a lot of health care, there's a lot of rural areas in Wisconsin and a lot of health care that's needed there. In terms of national OB trends, uh, what I found is uh, childbirth is the most common reason to go into the hospital in the United States. Uh, rural obstetrical care services have decreased dramatically. Uh, so the mid-80s, which is actually when I got into the world of medicine, um, half of all the rural counties had some um, hospital maternity services. And this has really decreased. By the early 2000s, only one-fifth, uh, um, so one out of five. So it was one out of two uh, three decades ago, and now it's one out of five that actually have a uh, hospital maternity services. So the actual, it's not just physicians are less there, but there's less um, hospital services. So this is something, there's a lot of research going on in the world of hospital administration. In terms of the national OB workforce, um, this is sort of an interesting study uh, that the, uh, one of the family physicians did, because in rural areas, a lot of the care is family physicians. but. Um, they looked at the, at the MOC applications uh, for all the physicians between 2000 and 2010, and there's a huge trend. Uh, less and less family physicians are actually um, providing OB services. So in, in 2000, it was 23%, and in 2010, only 10%. So, you know, here's the graph. You, you know, you don't need the graph, but I like you know, visuals and graphs. And, um, and that's, that's a real decline. Um, it's it, it, in the past, you know, family physicians were doing more OB. They were actually setting up fellowships to treat family, teach family physicians how to do C-sections to really provide these services. But I don't know why there's been a trend since the turn of the century. Le less and less family physicians are doing it, perhaps because more primary care things are being lopped on their plate. Um, and I don't know, uh, I haven't seen an analysis of the reasons, but this is, a, this is a concerning trend to me. What they did see in this study was younger female U.S grads uh, were the ones that were more likely to um, have OB in their practice. So um, just some interesting data about uh, a big portion of the rural OB workforce. 
So what about Wisconsin? So the um, Wisconsin Hospital Association um, put out a report in 2010, and uh, they called it the 100 new physicians a year, an imperative for Wisconsin. Uh, and it was actually uh, published in 2011, but they, they did all the uh, data analysis and writing in 2010. And they estimate that physician demand based on population growth and changing demographics in Wisconsin, there's gonna be a shortfall of over 2,000 physicians by 2030. Uh, they think they need about 100 new physicians per year to keep pace with the demand and that we have to make some significant changes in the medical education and training system in Wisconsin. So a couple of things have come from this. You may have read in the paper, um, the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin is doing a uh, Green Bay campus and I think a Wausau campus, and a Wausau campus. Um, I know they've increased the class size here. Uh, there's some talk of an osteopathic school in Wisconsin. So the medical schools have kind of responded. Um, at the GME level, it's trickier because um, you can't just like, you know, start a residency program like overnight. Um, there's, uh, there's limited GME funding, uh, there's limited sites that are willing to take it on, uh, there's you know patient population issues. In our field there's minimum numbers, um, and a lot of technical fields there's minimum, num minimum numbers. So it's a lot. Um, our institution, we keep adding residencies and fellowships every year, and the director of GME says, you know, we don't have funding for these. So there's, there, there's, a, there's a real rub there. Uh, but from this report, they really feel like there have to be more medical students trained, uh, more of those medical students need to stay in Wisconsin, and we need to provide more graduate medical education programs for them. In terms of OBGYN, now ACOG does all kinds of workforce um, planning issues across the nation. Uh, so they do a uh, analysis of every state. So here's what's going on in Wisconsin for OBGYN. There's 556 OBGYNs, uh, this is data as of 2014, uh, which is 2.3 per 10,000 women, uh, which is a little below the national average, uh, which is 2.65 per 10,000. So we're a little short on OBGYNs. Uh, there are actually, um, you know, always jobs in OBGYN in Wisconsin. And sometimes I wonder why don't more people come move to Wisconsin, because, I mean, I like it here. Um, and it's a, actually, uh, 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 compared to other states, those of you who have been in other states and practiced OBGYN, um, it's actually a relatively pleasant place to practice um, obstetrics um, in terms of um, a lot of the environment, litigation, and so forth. So the female population in Wisconsin is supposed to increase by 7.8 percent by 2030, um, and here's the statistic that you know is the soundbite for the news. If anybody's um, seen some of the uh, news coverage, so 26 of 72, or 36 percent of the Wisconsin counties, don't have an OBGYN practicing in their county. Um, the thing I don't usually tell the reporters is that nationally it's um, one half of the counties, so one half of the rural counties. So we're actually doing a little better than the nation in terms of our coverage of the, of the, of the counties. Um, but really, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of places that, that don't have an OBGYN in their community. And while others can provide obstetrical services, um, I believe to have a, a truly exceptional um, OB unit, you, you know, you, you're gonna be better off if you have an obstetrician along with your family physicians and your midwives and, um, and the occasional general surgeon that gets involved. So here's the, um, the color map of Wisconsin. So the no OBGYNs is this whole swath through here. Um, all of those counties, no OBGYNs. Some of them even quite close to, um, to our neighborhood. Um, you can see the place where there's three or more, um, you know, Dane County, the Milwaukee area, all the same places where the population is. Um, they, um, they, are replete with OBGYNs, but um, but in some of these other areas, um, not any OBGYNs practicing. This is the um, sort of partner map uh, from ACOG, and this is basically how long do you have to drive to get to a maternity center. So um, it, just as you would expect, the populated areas, it's going to be less than 15 minutes, all these areas in red, um, less than 30 minutes, but you know, 60 minutes, um, is basically in these areas where less hospitals, less physicians, and, um, and drive times are longer. Um, I didn't find any data in Wisconsin about, you know, 
does this drive time impact perinatal care? Uh, but I did find an interesting paper from Canada, um, and they have uh, data that drive times affect perinatal care. But for Canada, drive times, um, they don't measure them in minutes, they measure them in hours. <laughs> so, um, so if you're um, over four hours from a uh, maternity center, you definitely have um, some decreases in your um, perinatal outcomes. So I did look at the DHS, which is the, you know, the health department in Wisconsin, um, and they just issued the report on the annual Wisconsin birth and infant mortality, and um, I was looking for rural health data. Um, and uh, I think I need to partner with somebody in Pop Health, and I've already spoken with, um, with Deb. Are you here, Deb? Yep, spoken with Deb a little bit about, you know, digging into the data a little bit more to try and analyze Wisconsin. But, um, but this, is, this is their summary statement. This is what they do track on a regular basis, uh, which I found was interesting. And basically, number of births per thousand women are steady uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, the birth rate for teens is really interesting. It's just continues to decline uh, since 2000. Um, the preterm and low birth weight uh, graph is really interesting in the in the summary in the words they don't say anything about the trend but when you looked at the graphs that's actually climbing uh, in our state and all across the nation um, and I don't practice OB or perinatology so um, I don't you know I'm not going to comment on that but I found that kind of interesting and I assume it's because we're providing more care to younger and younger um, infants but um, but that's been steadily increasing uh, infant mortality no change obviously the the thing that we know because it's been uh, publicized um, a lot in Wisconsin at the medical school it's the life course initiative the african-american infant mortality rate is uh, just way too high it's it's three times times the, um, that of uh, Caucasian. And so there's a lot of work on that. Um, I could not find any clear aggregate statistics on the reproductive outcomes for rural areas. Um, as I said, um, it's something that we're going to work on. And then the last really interesting thing that they spend time doing is they do <laughs> spend time figuring out what are the most common names uh, on the birth certificates in Wisconsin. So in 2015, Emma and Noah uh, were the most common uh, the most uh, popular names. <laughs> so the rural obstetric workforce, um, there was actually an interesting paper, and I, 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 I didn't put a million slides in, uh, but there's the, uh, the public health uh, group, the rural public health group in Minnesota did um, a pretty decent, um, not just decent, a really comprehensive analysis of rural workforce issues in eight states. Um, kind of the ones you might, you might guess, Minnesota and Iowa and Colorado, but Wisconsin's also included. So, so there is some in-depth data. Um, the Wisconsin data sort of tracks with the, with the, uh, the rest of the states, so I, I, I'm just going <laughs> to present it in aggregate. And what they did was they did a phone survey, and they literally talked to 306 rural hospitals um, in these, I'm sorry, it was nine states, not eight. Uh, and they basically um, figured out that in low volume hospitals, those that have less than 240 deliveries a year, much more likely to have the combination of a family physician and a general surgeon, you know, uh, doing uh, the obstetric workforce, whereas the higher volume hospitals were more likely to have OBs and uh, CNMs. And that's kind of true as you look at this um, overall, um, the, in terms of the number uh, for all the hospitals, an average of four OB providers to three family practice providers. So the, it's family practice providers are doing a lot in these rural areas, but in the really lower um, number hospitals, um, you know, much more likely to be family physicians, whereas in the higher volume hospital, much more likely to be obstetricians. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because um, if you're an obstetrician, you have to have enough work to be an obstetrician and to stay there. And so they're going to be in the, in the areas that have enough volume to sustain their practices. So midwifery is another interesting thing, um, and there was a separate study um, on midwifery. In the, it, it, there was a recent analysis, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of this same data set. So uh, the CNMs attend about one out of three of the rural births. Uh, there's some variability based on uh, the practice regulations for the state um, for midwives. And if they're in a state that has autonomous practice regulations, they do 34%. But even in those that don't, that, that don't have autonomous practice regulations, they do 28%. So it, it's not a huge difference, but there's some difference if they are actually uh, 
um, certified in a more autonomous way, which is a, sort of a regulatory issue. Um, they tend to pair with OBs 86% um, of the time and with family physicians uh, less so. And it makes sense to me. I mean, if you're going to practice obstetrics, you need somebody with the, um, with the surgical skill set um, for those occasions where nature is not so friendly. So rural hospital administrators, um, definitely uh, a, a comment in this was that they were going to be looking to get more midwives um, to the rural areas. And I think that's true of all the uh, workforce providers, um, get more people to these hospitals. So what are there some, some of the barriers to physician recruitment and retention in rural areas? Um, this was a, a a, pub, a paper published um, recently in the Journal of Healthcare Quality and Assurance, and um, they were just basically looking at kind of what are the challenges and what are the things that seem to work. So in terms of challenges, um, people are concerned about lifestyle uh, and uh, limitations on activities, um, concerns, concerned about school quality, um, medical practice. Um, uh, some people are concerned that if they practice in a rural area, they're going to actually have longer hours, more on call, uh, less access to specialists and that the health of the population is going to be uh, less, so it's going to be harder work. Um, and then there's some competitive issues. The payer mix is going to differ in different places. But in terms of um, efforts to recruit uh, physicians into rural practice, some of the successes have been if people have a rural background, they're four times as likely uh, to practice medicine in a rural area. And if they have exposure to rural health and training, uh, so there are a number of different rural health um, medical school training tracks. The, the uh, Wisconsin uh, program is called the WARM program. I think most people are familiar with it. Who, in he, who here has been through a, a, a rural health track in medical school? Anybody? I know Kathleen, Janessa, Laura, yeah, University of Washington. Kristen, are you, you too? No. Some, I, somebody up there. <laughs> raise their hand. Um, but if you have exposure uh, to working in a rural community, um, you, you're more likely to um, take up practice in a rural community. And then um, I like this, um, the successes of people who are self-actualized um, and have a sense of place and community engagement and that they want to be a, you know, a bigger part of the community uh, tend to want to practice there. And um, obviously um, uh, the spouse has everything to do with um, where you end up practicing. So ACOG um, has a uh, workforce sheet, they've got a committee opinion on rural health disparities. Uh, they've done a lot of work in this regard. And their general recommendations are to promote sustainable collaborative models uh, with other OB providers, which makes sense. Um, improve practice efficiency, encourage more medical students to pursue OBGYN. And we've been uh, pretty successful with that lately. Uh, we have 10 this year. Um, and we've been in double digits for uh, several years. And, um, and another interesting fact is the applications for OBGYN, while they were going down a decade ago, um, have been on the rise since 2010. And, um, and it's, it's become more competitive, not less competitive. Um, accommodating lifestyle, that matters no matter where you live, uh, and flexible scheduling and uh, practice patterns. Um, and then publicizing loan repayment. Um, people may not know there are loan repayment programs in Wisconsin. Uh, that will um, that will do loan payback for people who choose to practice in rural areas. There's some interest there's some interest in bills and legislation at the federal level um, to try and get some of those places qualified for the um, the what's the name of the big program for loan that yeah I thought you knew you guys would know. <laughs> so um, they don't have on this sheet um, the. Uh, Increase uh, training in rural environments, um, but you know maybe they'll add it to the sheet because um, we're going to be the first program in the country uh, to have a rural track. Uh, there's been a lot of rural tracks in family medicine uh, that's been going on for a decade or more, um, and there's a lot of interest at the ACGME on rural tracks in specialty care. So how can we build our specialty? residency programs to have some kind of rural experience so that we can do uh, what um, seems to make sense is give people an experience in a clinical setting, in a rural clinical setting, so that they can um, envision themselves. I mean, what's it like to practice with one or two obstetricians uh, rather than a group of, of five or a group of ten? Um, so, it, and, and just, you know, you kind of have to have that experience because we also have data that where everybody, anybody does their residency, they're more likely to stay in that area because they get, they get, they get used to it. They, they get, to, they understand the program. 
So here are the top 10 rural medicine programs uh, in 2016. And um, I think we've got people from all these places. Washington, shout out to Washington, New Mexico, Oregon, Minnesota, Colorado. Do we have, a, oh, we kind of have somebody from Colorado. Wait, where did Aaron go? We need somebody from Colorado. We have some, no, we definitely have no Deckers here. Um, not in current training, but we've had plenty in the past. Um, so we came up number eight, Vermont, we're tied with Vermont. Uh, we have some definitely some good Vermonters here. Um, so, so these are the top uh, rural medicine programs, and so I think it's it's fitting that we should be the place to do the first um, OBGYN track. So, just to give you a little bit of background. Um, it really started with an idea in 2014. Uh, honestly, it started with Laurel's idea. Uh, the DHS uh, gave some grants out and the psychiatry department put a rural track together and the surgery department put a rural track together and, and Laurel said, well, we need to have a rural track. And, 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 <laughs> and I said, I just am learning how to run the residency. I've just been doing that for a year. So like, could we just do this another time? And you know, um, anybody who knows Dr. Rice well, uh, we'll know that you don't wait on these kinds of things. Um, so uh, the good thing about Dr. Rice is she pushes you out of your comfort zone. Um, uh, it, or maybe that's the bad thing. I don't know. But w when she pushes you out of your comfort zone, she usually has your back. So she's been super supportive. And John actually is the one um, who, uh, uh, in those early conversations, um, said, you know, yeah, I can, I can write a grant. I can write a grant for that. So, um, so you know, hats off to John. It, he got this um, RPAP grant, we got this RPAP grant, which is basically a Wisconsin uh, residency assistance program grant to basically develop the idea, not to, not to wholly fund the idea, but to develop the idea. And because of that, we were able to hire Jody Lund, and then um, we were able to get approval last year through the um, GMAC Council, which is the first hoop. Uh, we recruited all the rural partners last winter, um, and we uh, went on field trips, John and Jody and I, around southern Wisconsin. Then we got the ACGME approval last spring. Uh, ACGME is provisional approval. It's a pilot program. We get to have one person a year. As long as everything goes well, we can either continue that one or maybe grow it from there. Um, and the ARES opened just this month. Um, and then next uh, uh, summer, we're gonna have somebody. So I don't have a whole lot of details on the program, but I want to give you just the snapshot. Um, we, we developed the program, but the, the devil's in the fine details, which we're going to be developing over the next year. So here are the places where the rural resident will go. Um, Portage uh, with our um, alum, uh, Brenda Jenkin, which is going to be a great experience for them. There are two OBGYN physicians in Portage. Um, Watertown is another place, a, a, a partner of ours, um, uh, Dinesh Siddiqui. Is Ahmed here? Ahmed. He was the residency program director over at Aurora, um, and now he's practicing in Watertown with two or three other physicians. What does it say there? Uh, yeah, two other physicians, so three. So we've got two experienced residency educators, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, we also um, have our partners down in Monroe. Um, there are three physicians at the Monroe Clinic. Um, of all the places, they have the largest number of deliveries, so they're at 498. The smallest is the combination up here, so there's one physician in Waupon and one in Ripon. Uh, Whip, what was it, Carly? Wapan. Wapan. I can't say Wapan. <laughs> Wapan. Okay. So Wapan um, has 118 deliveries. Ripon has 42. Together they're the Agnesian Health System and they're both pretty close. So we basically were looking. I felt like we should find places that had good obstetrician gynecologists that were within an hour drive of Madison and that had a, that qualified. So um, for the purposes of the various grants and things, 20,000 people or less, that's how they define um, a, a community uh, as rural. Um, that, that's not the sort of official Fed de definition, but 20,000 or less is what RPAP says. So, um, so all these communities fit that bill. And we designed it so that they're going to come back on Thursday. So they'll be here Thursday morning, um, they'll do their continuity clinic on Thursday afternoon, and they'll be on site at the, uh, at the rural hospitals Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. And, uh, and we're uh, going to show you a little video, just so you can meet some of the docs that are involved.
This rural residency program, which we have begun, and we're the first in the United States, is set up to recruit individuals who want to work in rural Wisconsin particularly. I believe that this will have a tremendous impact overall on the care of women in the state and their families. So much of what happens for health care in a family begins with the woman. To provide this kind of care at this time of her life and to start our babies out on the right foot is just so very important. Wisconsin's a rural state, and there's a lot of communities that don't have OBGYN physicians. The new program, the Rural Residency Program, was conceived to really address those needs in a new way so that the residents have skills in those areas and experiences so that when they go to practice, they're actually able to be more effective. We have it set up so that they get the very best training, the very best the university has to offer, the Madison community has to offer, but also working with some of our regional partners so that they get some significant training in the community hospitals that they're gonna ultimately practice in. Our goal is to recruit the best and brightest medical students. They'll be very much a part of the UW family. They'll know all the faculty here. I see it as just residency plus. I'm originally from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Despite being a, in a small community, in a rural community, we have a very busy practice here. We have all the technologies available to us that you would have in a tertiary care center. Also unique to Monroe Clinic, despite it being in a rural community, is we have a strong teaching background. I saw an opportunity for Ribbon Medical Center that had not had women's health care in uh, 10 years, I believe it was. I think the most important thing a medical student would want to consider if they're considering a rural practice is whether or not they'll be happy living in a rural setting. Medically speaking, I think that you have to feel fairly confident in your knowledge and abilities to practice in a rural setting. We came here, um, we spent the day learning about Wapan Memorial Hospital and Indonesian Healthcare, and by the end of the day we were quite taken uh, uh, with the practice opportunity and with the community. I think the most important thing that the resident will see is that you can provide great care in a rural setting without all of the other specialists surrounding you. I really think the biggest difference is not technology, but the people. We have all the technology that larger hospitals have. The advantages of being part of the community where a part of your role is you're the OBGYN in town, it really is very rewarding. I just love Madison. I never met you. <laughs> <laughs> and I really got into the whole Madison one of the things that drew me to this program that has completely lived up to my expectations is the excellent surgical training here. Um, I love living here. <laughs> Okay, so in the future we'll have some rural track residents, but thank you very much for those of you that participated. <laughs> so I, I just wanted you to see what some of the, um, some of the physicians that we got recruited um, said, you know, because actually I would be kind of daunted by going somewhere where I was the only obstetrician in town. The guy from... Um, Wapan. Wapan. <laughs> um, he said his, he, he's on a call all the time, but it doesn't bother him at all. It's like he, he's not that busy. So, you know, like there, there's different practice models. I mean, you can be like crazy busy on call, like, you know, less often, or you can be on call more often and be not as busy. But, you know, that's not going to work for everybody. But it was just, it was just interesting, and, and, um, and, 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 and these are good OBGYNs, and, and I think that they'll do a nice job with the training. So just to give you the really 100,000 foot view, we're going to flesh out all the details on the rotations, but one of the, one of the themes is that we set it up so that they're going to stay in, in Madison for the first year, so they get all that OB experience that everybody gets in the first year, and um, and that when we send them to the um, smaller communities, they're going to have more experience. And then through their second and third year, they're going to um, they're going to be offsite. Um, basically half of each of those years. And then they're going to come back in fourth year and we're going to make sure that they um, have all the skills that they need, get all the cases that they need. Um, and so the whole design is basically to have 75% of their training 
um, in Madison and 25% of their training uh, in the smaller community hospitals. So rural health disparities exist in all the specialties. Wisconsin has a shortage. Rural background and medical training in rural sites are the two biggest predictors. Um, and maybe this small program, which could grow, um, will uh, help alleviate the problem here. And I know there's a lot of interest in other residency programs to try and do the same thing. So um, we'll see where it goes. It's, it, 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 it's starting small, but it's, it's, it's a big project um, to, to make this kind of change. So I absolutely need to thank um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Laura Rice, <laughs> who, uh, who is self-nicknamed as the Honey Badger. Okay, so just so everybody knows, this is, <laughs> this is this is not my nickname for her, this is her nickname for herself, and she has earned it. Um, and really hats off to John Street and Jody Lund, and we have a group of residents that are helping, Carly and Patrice and Ashley and Kathleen are helping um, as we develop like the details, because um, as everyone knows, the devil is in the details. And um, I just am going to end there, and then uh, Jody and uh, John and I can take questions, and then we'll have plenty of time to break before, before uh, Steve. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Questions? Mary. I have a question. I just want to applaud this whole program. I think it's phenomenal. My experience with rural, other than I live rural in Wisconsin, between here and rural, um, is in northern Wisconsin. And if we have any hope of addressing those access issues, I think this is exactly the right way to do it. Um, exposing folks and letting them see that, yeah, I can live this lifestyle in terms of, yeah, so I'm going to call every third or every night. It's not something undoable because it's not anything like what it looks like. Well, yeah, well, when you do the math and you, you know, you say, well, I've got 100 deliveries a year, that's like one every three days. I mean, that's a lot different than the call that, you know, that groups in Madison are taking. Sure. Uh, so. But nonetheless, the rural um, settings support the care of a patient, maybe a little bit differently. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But the other thing that I wanted to say is I think that for the whole residency program, and I, it was the gentleman from um, Ripon who made this statement, to, to go into a rural community, you really have to have confidence in your skill set because you don't have an OBGYN colleague to consult with who's close. Right. So in terms of how we address um, all of our residents in the fourth year, I think that it is an opportunity to inspire all of us to allow the fourth years to hopefully have a little bit more um, independence in decision making, um, including in the OR where we really are trying to sit back, let them do the basic surgical cases, not the super uber complex things, but you know, that our basic cases, and be in the room as their consultant, so that they really have the opportunity to make interoperative decisions so that they can leave this program with the confidence that they could go out in a rural community and actually do this, because having mentored residents for the last 20-ish years, that is the biggest barrier that most folks feel as they leave residency, and it has progressively become more of an issue that they just don't feel confident that they can go out and function alone in yeah. the community with a general surgeon and family docs as being their colleague. Well, medical uh, medical training has changed, and um, the rules have changed. You know. Um, when I trained, there wasn't any kind of rule to have a faculty in the operating room. Uh, and, and, and of course they should. I wasn't saying we should go back. That wasn't my point. My, my point wasn't that we shouldn't go back. Uh, we should go back. My point is that I agree with you. I think we need more cases where the fourth year is walking the, the uh, junior resident through the case and the faculty is stepping back um, appropriately in the appropriate situation in the room, scrubbed or not scrubbed, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and northern Wisconsin is gorgeous. So, so. A couple of questions. Uh, one, there's no obligation uh, for the rural track resident to actually practice in a rural setting, correct? No, there's not an obligation, um, but I read a lot of papers on rural tracks, and uh, and and most of the places get um, 
either half or two thirds of the graduates um, to choose that on their own. Um, there isn't, in, in our program, there's not a, you know, you have to, and most of the programs don't do a, you have to, because I don't know, it's a little, you know. I was cur curious, because my goal in life as a medical student was to be an OBGYN in Newcastle, Indiana, and clearly far, far afield from that uh, setting, but, so you just never know what you're going to Well, exactly, the yeah. Other. The other question is, what about, who pay, do you guys pay for travel? How do they get a travel stipend to get well, places? Yeah, we, um, we, well, the, we have the grant, the grant's helping us in the beginning. Uh, the Madison hospitals are covering the time here, and we're working on, a, the, you know, the funding, the sustainability funding, um, and, um, and yeah, that's all included. Um, the reason we chose close is, is we wanted to be able to bring them back each week. Um, I think, ideally, some of these sites in northern Wisconsin would sort of be on the, you know, on the list or in some of these these less populated areas, uh, but we just kind of have to start somewhere. And, um, and I hear you, you know, I applied to residency and I thought I wanted to be an MFM. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have the paperwork to prove it. <laughs> just to talk a little bit more about what Mary brought up, do you, um, the, the expectations for somebody going into this, into a community like this have to be pretty high. Um, do we want them to have a, a, even a higher bar of what they can do? do we, um, make sure they're surgical, and we want everybody to be good when they leave, but um, without partners, without any kind of an infrastructure to help them, they're really going to be on their own, they have to really almost be better. Be yeah, I, you know, I think we're actually trying to build it in, in fact, at the CCC meeting, we just talked about trying to build in some kind of a uh, observership at the end of third year to kind of certify the fourth years for kind of independence, if you will, in a variety of the technical skills. Um, so that we're already moving towards that, and um, I think that is the same type of thing that, that, that we'll want to see. Um, we have a lot of people that, um, that that actually have graduated and done things like this, not necessarily going to be the only OBGYN town, but you know, um, I don't know, Kevin Benson, he took off and you know, I mean, yeah, uh, all, yeah, Alex Mamanoff, we have a whole bunch of people. Um, but I, I think that the, I think that it's it's really important, you know, what you guys say. They you know they have to be confident and skillful. A lot of these physicians actually practiced in larger communities and then moved to these smaller communities. Um, so I just I, I I think we'll have to pay attention to that. Other questions, comments, Katie? Um, are people applying specifically to this track? Yeah, we had a lot of conversations about how should we do that, Ryan and Jackie and the residents and I. Uh, we decided to let everybody apply to both and then, um, and, or apply to, you know, just one. Um, so uh, of, the, of the ones that we have applying to the rural track, there's only four that are only applying to the rural track. So I, we're actually going to look at those applications even closer. Um, because they're pretty committed and, and there's going to be a lot of people, what they had in general surgery and what I think we'll see is a lot of people are going to apply to both as a way to try and get in the program, right? Because it's a competitive program. So Greg, did you, or uh, Amanda? I mean, I think we have a question at Andrew's. What is the housing situation like for them? So are they going to be credited in the world? Are they going to have to move every day? Is that so um, in my perfect world, they can choose. Um, and um, Jody, we've got housing set up at a couple places. Jody's like on the street with these people. So what, what, do you have any comments on that? Um, so Monroe actually has student housing. So they actually have a medical school. Um, so they will be able to stay in the student housing when they're there. And the other sites they'll have the option to stay at a hotel. That's yeah, we'll do sort of an extended stay hotel kind of thing. So. Jake? Um, one of the things, like you mentioned, like that ACOG promotes in terms of improving the OBGYN task force was like collaborative models. Yeah. I feel like when you look at why there's been such a decline in access, it's really not because there's been a change in OBGYNs, but it's that attrition of family medicine providers who are doing obstetrical care over the last 50 years. But like when you go to these sites around Wisconsin, are there, are there places in Wisconsin that are doing collaborative care either with nurse midwives or family medicine providers that are doing it really well that we can Exactly, and I, I talked to the, the director of rural, rural health in Wisconsin and um, 
and in, in my dream, you know, we could work to figure out what is the collaborative model that works. The, the, this amount of deliveries, this amount of OBs, this amount of midwives, this amount of family, you know, like, um, but right now, if you look at the data for Wisconsin, it's basically just patchwork, you know, um, you know, as I said, and I don't know that anyone's written um, or described sort of, you know, the perfect OB team, you know, because we're even leaving out the nurse anesthetists and the anesthesiologists and the nurses because in the smaller hospitals they have to be cross-trained. They're, they're labor and delivery nurses one day and then they're going and doing med or surge um, the next day because they don't always have somebody in labor. So it's the whole workforce thing is once you start looking at it, it's more complicated than you even imagine. Back in the back. Did you say loan repayment? Yeah. But that may be unique to your medical school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. I don't know. That's another person to hit up for funding. Well, they're joining residents. Yeah, there are loan forgiveness programs in Wisconsin to keep people in. There's two different programs currently uh, in Wisconsin to, to do loan forgiveness for people who practice in the rural sites. But I don't know about the I don't know about the rural rotations and residency. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Let's see where we are. I don't want to steal Steve's time because he's pretty fabulous. Okay, other questions? Uh, funding is to go to the rural hospitals that are currently offering um, uh, maternity care. Would you like to ask them to go to the community hospitals that are currently offering maternity care? to support through a fund through the department some of the resident expenses yeah. Um, like yeah, that's a good yeah, idea. That's yeah, solid. we're also looking uh, for a grant from um, who are the dairy people we were talking to talk to? Oh, I don't think it's going to dairy people, but there's a federal grant that is coming up that we could yeah, but it's a way to engage the, the hospitals. State yeah. With, we're doing this mm -hmm. and in an effort to try to support hopefully the people who practice early in Wisconsin mm -hmm. and really raising an awareness that we're that we're doing this, mm -hmm. and then that will you know. You know, even students applying to medical school, oh my gosh, there really are these things like general surgery, rural tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an interest in, in um, at the medical school in particular to, to, to have us build out a track like this in all the specialty areas. Right. Lauren, did you have something? Yeah, are you hoping that this resident is from Wisconsin? Like, do you want this person to stay in rural Wisconsin, or what if they want to go to rural Wyoming? Or? Well, my first dream is that they, they, they practice in rural Wisconsin. My second dream is that they practice somewhere rural. So, so, it, you know, we we had it. We had a, a sort of a group about what's the perfect applicant, and you know, the perfect applicant is from a, a, a underserved area in Wisconsin and, and came to the Warm program and did well in the Warm program, and then decided they want to do OBGYN. I mean, that's like the perfect applicant. But but you know, do we not want to, you know, train people for rural areas in other states? Well, of course we do. It's just that there's, um, you know, some of this is using state dollars, and so there's an interest in that. I'll just think, take one more. I thought I saw one more. Yeah. So the other um, trickle down effect of this or trickle over effect is I don't think we should look at it as um, not meeting our goal if the folks that identify in the rural track choose not to in the end. Oh, well, no, we're going to, if they go anywhere rural, that's good. In fact, if they graduate and do well, we're going to we're gonna claim that as fabulous. We're going to have maybe unintended consequences, but I think it can be anticipated simply their exposure to Monroe and how practices there in Waupon and Ripon and Portage, et cetera, they're going to be talking with all 20 whatever number of the residents it'll be then. And they will be raising an awareness and so there will be others who likely will see themselves as oh, yeah. more able to practice and it's not quite so unfamiliar. Exactly. I think the potential mm -hmm. by developing this is 
huge and not necessarily only impacting that person who is, you know, identifying that they want to do this. But I think we probably will get more residents who see this as doable. Yeah. If yeah. not now in three years or Perfect. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Let's take a break and uh, come back in eight.